Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Steve Call. I'm the Dean of the Columbia Journalism School. And I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you to tonight's conversation with the 2020 J. Anthony Lucas Prize winners. I'm sorry, we're conducting this conversation virtually rather than in the world room at Columbia. And I hope we're back together again next year uh, in the way we annually celebrate uh, these wonderful awards in the memory of one of the great nonfiction narrative writers of any generation, certainly a great influence on the generation uh, of writers that I, I grew up around and probably some of the folks who are being honored tonight. What we're gonna do tonight uh, is try to concentrate on the substance rather than the ceremony since Zoom is not uh, a capacious place to uh, exchange awards and, and the like. Uh, so we're gonna have a series of conversations with our four winners um, and then I'll, I'll walk us through that and when we're done, uh, we'll take your questions in chat and we'll try to wrap up in an hour um, using the Zoom best practice of not leaving you in front of your computer screen for uh, too long a time, especially this time of day. Um, as we get started, for those of you who may be new to the awards and uh, to the legacy that they honor, uh, we have a short uh, video about the J. Anthony Lucas Prizes. When people talk about book writing, they almost always talk about the process of writing, sitting there by the keyboard and writing it down. And it is in many respects not the most important because the most important part is the reporting. Tony Lucas started as a newspaper reporter. He's an incredibly diligent reporter, and so you see the really old-fashioned devotion to fact. Tony's kind of work was detailed and serious, but also an entertaining yarn as well. He had this kind of set of ideas about nonfiction writing, and what he really hoped for was that there would be a sort of elevation of nonfiction book writing to the level of literature. Tony cared so much about the craft, but he really cared also about other people's work in this area. When Tony died, I went to Arthur Gill and said, you know, I want to do something to carry forward what Tony cared so passionately about. But let us congratulate our winners. So if you look at the people who've won this award in the past, David Marinus, Robert Caro, Samantha Power, Jane Mayer, David Finkel, and on and on, we think of them as in this kind of elite group of American authors who aspire to the kind of quality we see in Tony's work. Then there is what we call the Mark Linton History Prize, which is named for the late uh, Mark Linton. None of this would be possible without the support of the Linton family. And as we talked about what narrative nonfiction had meant to Tony, there emerged this idea of not just this one book award, but a work in progress award. When I got the award, it really allowed me to delve in more deeply, to take more time. And it also gave me this layer of institutional half and legitimacy that, especially for a first time author, it, it, it gave me confidence. The prize was so meaningful to me because his kind of work narrative nonfiction that is both serious and incredibly entertaining is exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. What Tony Lucas did in his work and many of our winners do in their work is they blend storytelling with a social conscience. And the idea was to hold Tony and his work up as standard bearers uh, for authors, and if you look at the two decades now of prize winners, I think you can say the board has really done that. It's kind of a, a pantheon of excellence. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, and you can see why we're so proud at Columbia to be the stewards of these prizes. And I want to thank uh, the judges and the board members uh, who participated this year in renewing this uh, commitment to the kind of work that, that Tony left us. And also uh, to thank the past winners for being with us tonight and look forward uh, 
to hearing from some of you. And as was mentioned in the film, uh, we owe a great debt to the Linton family for their support of this uh, institution as it's become. Uh, now let me introduce the four winners that we're gonna speak with tonight and that we're honoring uh, here together. Uh, first, uh, Alex Kotlowitz is the Lucas Prize winner this year for An American Summer, Life and Death in Chicago. Uh, welcome, Alex. Hi, Steve, thanks for having me. Good to see you in Chicago. Um, and the Lucas Prize uh, that uh, we're celebrating with Alex tonight carries a $10,000 honorarium. Uh, Alex is the author of the national bestseller, There Are No Children Here, and several other books, including this, which has a, a kind of relationship by family tree with, uh, uh, with No Children Here. And his uh, work has appeared in The Times Magazine, The New Yorker, and uh, adapted for This American Life, which he's also authored, and he's a writer in residence at Northwestern University. Um, Kerry Greenwich uh, is the winner this year of the Mark Linton History Prize. Uh, it also carries a $10,000 honorarium. Uh, and she's being honored for her book, Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. Uh, Kerry has been felled by Zoom glitches, but if she's here, I welcome her. Kerry, are you here? There you are. We may not be able to hear you, but we can see you, um, and I hope you can hear us. Um, Carrie teaches in Tufts uh, Consortium of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora, where she's the director of the program in American Studies, and also the co-director of the African American Trail Project. She's joining us from Massachusetts, and we will try to fix her microphone. Um, now we turn to the two winners of the Works in Progress uh, award that uh, Beth Macy talked about uh, so well in the video. Uh, it's really a distinctive institution in American nonfiction uh, and journalism. $25,000 prize uh, for two works in progress each year. And this year's winners are uh, Shahan Mufti uh, for his forthcoming book, American Caliph, The True Story of the Hanafi Siege, America's First Homegrown Islamic Terror Attack. Welcome, Shahan. Thank you, Steve. And uh, he's a journalist and professor of journalism at the University of Richmond in Virginia. And he previously worked as a reporter at the Christian Science Monitor and was a Fulbright Scholar in India where he, discovered, where he researched political Islam. Uh, and then our second Works in Progress Award winner tonight is Bart Elmore. Uh, for his uh, forthcoming book, Seed Money, Monsanto's Past and Future of Food. Uh, welcome, Bart. Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to see you in Ohio. Uh, Bart is an associate professor there of environmental history and a core faculty member of Ohio State's Sustainability Institute and a class of 2017 National Fellow at the New America Foundation. Uh, his first book was Citizen Coke, as in Coca-Cola, uh, the Making of Coca-Cola Capitalism, and it examined the environmental impact of Coke's uh, worldwide operations. Um, so I will try to hold myself to about 10 minutes uh, or less with each of the four winners, starting with the two works in progress uh, winners, and then uh, on chat as we wind down with about 15 minutes to the hour, we'll welcome your questions and I'll, I'll try to pass those around to our guests. So Bart, let me start with you. Um, your, your book is about uh, one of the big subjects in American environmental debate and discourse these days, global debate and discourse, which is whether genetically modified foods are a good thing, a dangerous thing, uh, how impactful they are. And I was struck um, by one of the theses, the, at least as I understood it of the book, which was no matter your view of the risks and the impact of um, GFM that you find that Monsanto hasn't really delivered on their, pro on their promise that genetically engineered seeds haven't advanced uh, agricultural productivity to the degree forecasted or promised. Can you say a little bit more about that finding in your work? Yeah, absolutely. And I also just want to say thanks to the prize committee as well. It's such a crazy moment where we're all here on Zoom and um, these prizes go a long way to help us out to finishing this project. So 
I just wanted to say thanks so much. Um, I should say that when I started this, I really didn't think I was, it wasn't the GMOs that first drew me in. Um, and when I started it, it was actually, I was writing the ch caffeine chapter on Coca-Cola, trying to figure out where Coca-Cola got its caffeine from. And it turned out that Monsanto was their chief caffeine supplier. Um, weirdly, they produced it from waste tea leaves of all things. Uh, so tea leaves that were left around on, on tea exchanges around the world and in this kind of recycling system. And so I got hooked on that. I ended up going to Wash U and finding their, their uh, archives there at Washington University. And, and I just dove into the story. Um, and to your point, I didn't know what was going to be the most interesting finding. Um, but being at Ohio State, which is also a tremendous agricultural you know, institution with top weed scientists here, I really became fascinated with these questions of what do we actually know now that we're 20 years or more, a little bit more than 20 years now from the first introduction of Roundup Ready, glyphosate resistant, herbicide tolerant, genetically engineered seeds. And really, to your point, what stuck, what really stood out was these, this data on yield. That 20 years ago, the argument was we need these things to feed the world, right? That, that these, the yield of, of these genetically engineered crops will be so much more than what we had before. And I kind of took that as a given. Well, we got to accept all these other costs, the herbicide costs and everything else. But that just didn't end up being so. So it ended up interviewing um, the top scientists for, uh, that did the National Academy of Sciences study uh, Fred Gould at North Carolina State and asked him, you know, am I reading this right? The yield data seems to be the same as when we look at conventional varieties that are conventionally bred. He said, yep, yeah, that's kind of what we're seeing. And so for me, I think that's a really important thing for us to be discussing. You know, if we're thinking about the future of food, um, I think now historians, just uh, what I do, we can weigh in on this. We now have 20 plus years of data and I think there are real questions about uh, whether this promise of productivity is really holding true. Well, um, so not a, an impressive result, but a very uh, dramatic effect. Nonetheless, you write that uh, Monsanto's kind of seed enterprises are radically reshaping global ecosystems. Um, so tell us how that has happened over those 20 years from the perspective of environmental history and do you have a net assessment, as they say in Washington? Has is, is this radical altering been demonstrably damaging, demonstrably beneficial, or is it just change that you would rate as um, difficult to describe in those terms? It's a great question, Steve. I think you know one of the most interesting journeys, I did a couple of journeys, one to Vietnam, because there, What's fascinating, right, is the same company that produced Agent Orange, we of course know Dow Chemical did as well. But if you look at volume production, Monsanto actually produced more Agent Orange. And what was interesting there was, here's a company that's now coming into Vietnam selling the seeds of life, <laughs> food. Interestingly, corn of all things, which if you think about Vietnamese cuisine, <laughs> this is interesting. But um, but, you know, that location was really interesting to think about, wow, how did, how did the company overcome that past? You know, literally down the street from their headquarters where I walked in uh, uh, kind of unannounced uh, is a museum that talks about Monsanto's Agent Orange and their impacts on that environment. So that was an interesting story. But I, I really point to Brazil uh, when I think about the global impacts. One of the big issues right now is a, a herbicide called dicamba which has just emerged to, in the last several years, as a way of dealing with Roundup resistant weeds. So we sprayed so much Roundup, which is this herbicide that Monsanto sold since the 1970s, that weeds became really resistant to it. So to deal with this, uh, Monsanto, now Bayer, German owned company, um, is selling these stacked genetically engineered seeds that have both resistance to Roundup and resistance to dicamba. Well, the problem with dicamba is that it's very volatile, particularly in hot climates. 
And one of the things we've seen here in the United States is that dicamba has drifted. So when you spray this herbicide, it actually volatilizes, it gets volatile and it jumps up in the air and will spread onto other farms. And if you don't have dicamba resistant genetically engineered seeds, your farms get hit. And uh, there are court cases, I've sat in on them here in the United States where farmers are livid about this, right? That their farms have been affected by this. When I went to Brazil, to your point, this scared the heck out of the people there. Uh, the farmers I could talk to, the, the um, weed scientists at the top universities in Brazil, because that, they, were, they were just approving this dicamba uh, system there. And if you think about hot climate in the Cerrado, you know, these tropical environments, this dicamba spread in, in, in the way that that will force compliance for farmers who don't want to get genetically engineered seeds, I think is a really concerning problem for the future. Um, we're talking a lot about Roundup right now, but I really think dicamba is, is, uh, is the next big story. Yeah, well, thank you. There's so much more here, but um, with an eye on the clock, I'll move uh, now to Shahan. Um, I think uh, reading your, your uh, excerpts and your book proposal was a reminder of what a what a decade the 1970s were, starting with, uh, you know, Kent State and Altamont. Kent State was in the 70s, wasn't it? And ending with um, events like the Hanafi siege, one bombing after another. But this was an enormous crisis that, as you point out, uh, I, I don't remember whether it was in your proposal, but that when you would explain to people what this uh, book was about, they would often say, why has no book been written about this before? So I think uh, first we'd need to ask you to please remind us what the Hanafi seed was exactly, uh, as succinctly as possible. What, when did it happen? Where did it happen? And what happened? Uh, okay, so what was the Hanafi seed? Uh, it was three days in March 1977, March 9th through 11th, about 40 hours in total, where um, three locations in Washington, D.C. were taken over by three groups of armed men uh, all from the same group. Um, and uh, they took about 100 and uh, close to 150 hostages in these three locations. These three locations were um, the B'nai B'rith, uh, which was on Rhode Island Avenue, and uh, the Islamic Center on Massachusetts Avenue, and then the district building that's now the John Wilson Building, just kind of right across the street from the White House. And uh, these, the, this, they all came from this group called uh, uh, Hanafi Muslims, who were headquartered in Washington, D.C., and under the leadership of this man uh, named Hamas Abdul Khalis. And uh, yeah, it was for three days straight, three nights, it, this dominant, I mean, it completely dominated uh, network evening news, and, and it was on the front page of newspapers across every, you know, small town newspapers, big city newspapers across the world. This thing was headline news for three days, and um, uh, yeah, and it and it ended uh, after three days uh, when um, uh, after three Muslim ambassadors uh, decided to enter the B'nai B'rith where the hostage leader was and try to negotiate a settlement. Uh, and so, just the kinds of events that, if they were to happen today. There is no way I could imagine that we would forget about this, just kind of considering the elements here. Um, but there was something about that period, like you said, maybe it was the 70s, there was a lot happening. Uh, or, or perhaps, and, and that's something I'm still exploring, is that it's perhaps something about Islam and what it meant at that time in the United States mm. and to Americans and how it kind of slipped yeah. out of memory. Uh, how did the hostage taking end for the sake of our audience? Um, the hostage, I mean, there it was a deadly- Spoiler uh, alert. <laughs> what's that, sorry? Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler, big time. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it, it was a deadly event. Uh, there were casualties. Uh, but in the end, the, the, the Muslim ambassadors were able to talk. They had a face-to-face -face meeting in the presence of a couple of unarmed police officers. Uh, but they were able to convince the hostage leader to let all, all the hostages go, and and on the condition that the hostage leader also walk out, and he slept in his bed that night, and that's kind of like the third act of the book. And uh, thinking of uh, the kind of narrative nonfiction that the Lucas Prize 
uh, honors. Um, here you have a very tight uh, but resonant event that's ripe for narration uh, with detail and character and setting, but uh, it's some distance in the past and so you need um, rich sourcing. How did you um, discover the materials or the survivors uh, who could really bring this story beyond the yellowed newspaper clippings to a different level of uh, reader experience? Yeah, you know, Theo, I'm, I think I'm very lucky to have caught this story at the moment I did, uh, because yeah, it's, it's now over 40 years old. Um, and, uh, but a lot of the people are, are around. Um, it, every kind of moment of the story of these 40 hours, there were moments in the negotiating room, there were the police command center, they were the hostage, the places where the people were being kept hostage. Uh, every place, every location I've been able to, almost every place I've been able to find people who witnessed it firsthand. So, you know, that I'm lucky. And those people who were in their 30s and 40s are now in their 70s and 80s and some in their 90s. Uh, even one of the Muslim ambassadors survives. Uh, there were three and one of them, uh, the last Iranian ambassador to the United States, uh, Ardashir Zahidi, he lives in, in, in Montreux, Switzerland, where I was able to meet him. So, I mean, I've been, I've been very lucky to be able to find people and, and, and a lot of the hostages, but really, you know, I could, relying on memory of an event that old would not have been enough. And so I've been really lucky with other sources as well, which has been really satisfying as a, as a reporter um, to be able to get the, you know, evidence from the Washington Metropolitan Police Department. And FBI was keeping track of my main character for about, about over, you know, 25 years. So, and uh, I've been able to get those files, which took a while. <laughs> but there, there has been, it's just, and, and, you know, there was extensive court uh, cases after um, it all ended, the siege ended. So there was, it's just been this really satisfying mix from a, a, a narrative perspective of somebody creating the narrative of, of being able to use both of these things of interviews with sources but also have really rich uh, archival material um, and, and print material to rely on and, and news. I could go on uh, as, as with Bart, but um, I want to welcome Carrie into the conversation. Uh, <laughs> are, are you with us, uh, Carrie? Can you hear me? I can, yes. You've got a phone as a solution. That's. Uh, <laughs> yes, it looks ingenious. Yes, it, it is. I, I, I apologize. I, I always say I'm a writer and a historian. Technology is probably not my strong suit. So apologies. <laughs> um, although I've been teaching on Zoom for the past couple of weeks. So thank sure. you for having me and yeah, for your well, patience. Congratulations to you. And um, uh, you know, I, I, I we've, we've got uh, dozens of folks, students and others, uh, listening in and. I was grateful for the opportunity to uh, read um, about the life of William Monroe Trotter, about whom I must uh, confess to my shame that I really didn't know very much about. I certainly knew about the times that he lived in, uh, but the centrality of his role and the, and the, the kind of trajectory that he had on the spectrum of of um, black thought and action and responses to Jim Crow was absolutely fascinating and distinctive, uh, partly because he came from Boston, but also because of the ideologies uh, that he um, wrestled with and expressed. Um, so if, if it's uh, not too difficult, um, introduce us to why you were drawn to him as a biographical subject and what about his trajectory through that first 20 years uh, of the last century, uh, you thought needed to be illuminated at this length and this scale and that was neglected in, in our kind of received history of that period. So I approached William Monroe Trotter's life from um, the perspective that Boston, New England and areas outside of the post reconstruction South are often ignored when we have conversations about our broader um, political and racial political history. 
and particularly this notion that a place like Boston's history is often um, uh, cut into two time periods, the period before the Civil War in which um, there was sort of this, supposedly this abolitionist, um, uh, radical abolitionist history, uh, William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass and such, and then uh, the Civil War, and then there's not a lot between the Civil War and like the 1970s and some suddenly buffing came, right? That's kind of the, the, the idea that we, we have. And so I really want to get into what was happening um, in a place like New England that we often don't think of as having, number one, um, a racial footprint outside of antebellum abolition and 20th century um, civil rights. And two, um, what does it look like when you have somebody like Trotter who was arguing for pretty radical notions of rights and justice at a time when um, historically, and the historiography would say that that came later. Um, so I grew up in the New England area. I grew up hearing about William Monroe Trotter from my grandparents who were civil rights activists when I went to graduate school and received my doctorate. I wanted to do research on him and on the black press. And um, I was often frustrated um, outside of my uh, advisor that um, this, there was this notion that you couldn't do a history of black people outside the South between 1865 and 1930s because, um, you know, they didn't have a lot of uh, voting rights um, and the North in particular um, was a, a haven for black people as opposed to um, sort of a place that had its own complicated racial history. So I really approached Trotter's life like that. I firmly believe that Trotter is one of those people who um, his life and his activism and his quirks and also the his um, you know, problematic views of, of justice and of America and particularly of gender um, really uh, give us a window into the complicated history of civil rights in this country and also the complicated relationship between African Americans um, and the political process, right? We kind of have this notion that black people um, couldn't vote until 1870, the vote was denied, then black people somehow magically became Democrats after um, the election of uh, Roosevelt and, um, you know, that the GOP was the party of Lincoln and really Trotter's um, trajectory and Trotter's um, uh, involvement in um, electoral politics, but also in involvement in radical black politics really challenges that notion. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned uh, the black press and of course one of his principal vehicles across this time was the Guardian. Uh, can you tell us about that newspaper and its place in the discourse and the arguments among um, black political leaders and intellectuals of that period? Uh, because he was, he, he was not a shrinking um, uh, violet in these um, arguments with Dubois, with Booker T and with others of his uh, contemporaries, but he had, a, he had a megaphone in The Guardian that he, that he used uh, powerfully. Yes, I, Trotter's Guardian newspaper began in 1901. At the time that it began, as I say in the book, it was really a, a time period when the press, and particularly the black press, were dominated by um, these interests. Um, particularly uh, conservative racial advocates, both in the North and the South, and also this notion that um, the press should be a way to um, only highlight African-American achievement and not highlight the very real political and, and um, economic issues that were facing African-Americans following Reconstruction. And so the newspaper, I, I, I argue in the book, um, really became a vehicle for Trotter, but also a vehicle for African-American people who um, most of whom I found in my research were not involved in the Booker T. Washington, Washington Du Bois debate, right? That was kind of a very academic debate that most people, average person in 1905, black person living in New York or living in Chicago um, was not really involved in. And so what were those people actually talking about? And the newspaper is a great way to look at um, how it is that, um, you know, this, this black consciousness was being created in a format that, uh, for the most part, except for The Guardian, and, until really about 1910, was dominated by these interests within the newspaper that were squelching black discontent and political, um, political debate. And so um, the newspaper, I think I, I said something, you know, in the, in the introduction about how the, news, the newspaper, The Guardian, at this time in the early 20th century, really illustrates the power of the press, the power of, of newspapers, um, independent newspapers in particular to foment political activism and political consciousness within a group of people um, who 
previously were uh, considered disenfranchised and were um, considered demobilized by the, the violence of the end of Reconstruction, that the press really became this vehicle through which um, they could um, exercise their, uh, their activism. And just last question, you use uh, naturally, as we all do, uh, phrases like conservative and radical. In the context of Boston and New York and The Guardian in that period, what, how would you describe his ideology in context? So William Monroe Trotter was a radical in the sense that he comes from this tradition of African-American people underneath slavery deciding for themselves how they're going to liberate themselves from slavery. And so I argued that within that tradition, um, that Trotter was somebody who fundamentally believed that African-American people should decide uh, their terms of liberation and emancipation based on their own needs and desires, and that it should not be dictated by either, um, you know, uh, people who called themselves race men or race women, and it should not be decided by well-meaning but often short-sighted white liberals in uh, New England and New York who had a very specific vision of what they saw for African-American people. So in that sense, he was radical. He also was somebody who really did not believe that either political party served the needs of African-American people. Um, he was critical of the GOP, but he was also critical of the Democrats. Um, and he really believed that black people needed to vote um, in terms of what was of, of greatest interest to the majority of African-American people economically and socially. Well, thank you so much for, for that and for the, book, for the book. Congratulations on the prize. And I'm sure we'll circle back to you when we get to our uh, audience questions in a few minutes. All right. Me, thank you so much. Thank you. And let me turn now to Alex Kotlowitz. Uh, uh, who's dedicated so much of his career to uh, documenting the the toll and the and the context of gun violence in Chicago? Um, he wrote, uh, "There are no children here," for which he's justly celebrated, uh, even almost thirty years after it was published. Um, and he's really dedicated himself. Uh, across a, a long period of time uh, to, this, to this setting and to these issues. You know, I was, I was struck, um, Alex, in the, in the way you framed the book, um, and I don't, I don't wanna uh, mischaracterize this, but in setting up the narrative of the summer where you do this great immersion reporting and, and narrative, um, you, you sort of guide the reader by saying um, what the book is not, it's not a book about solutions. It's not a book about public policy. And you even allow yourself a comment. I have no idea what will work or what would change the, the environment. And I don't want to pretend that, that I'm guiding you towards insights about public action. And I guess I read that two ways. One was signaling that this is going to be a narrative. This is going to be about what happened and who was there. And so please uh, abandon your aspirations for something other than narrative. But also a little bit of a, you know, a cri de coeur, you know, you, I, I, I have been with this subject for so long and I'm at a loss. Can you talk about both of those? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. First of all, Steve, I got to say this award is such a uh, profound honor. I mean, I, I like all those others in the video, you know, we stand on the shoulders of Tony Lucas. And I remember reading Common Ground and thinking, this is what I want to do, you know, to be able to somehow create literature, or at least aspire to, at least create literature out of fact. So this is just, this honor means a lot. Um, yeah, you know, I, um, I, I did have this kind of um, kind of confession in, in, in the front of the book um, that this it was not a book about public policy. It was not gonna present solutions. And part of it is that I feel very strongly that, you know, we tell stories not necessarily to answer questions, but really to ask them. And so, my hope is that by going out and you know listening and ultimately telling the the stories of individuals that you begin to ask questions you begin to see things you haven't seen before um uh you begin to ask questions maybe you hadn't thought to ask before um and it also is kind of as you say a creed of core and i think so not so much about the gun violence but really i think about the profound poverty and profound inequity in our cities of which the violence i think is very much a symptom of, it. Um, and um, and I just I really I feel so strongly in the power 
of narrative, and I think of it as kind of the bigness of the, of the, the small story. You know, you tell these small, intimate stories that speak to something larger and something more universal. And that was what I was hoping to get at in this book, was really to begin to ask questions that we hadn't been asking. All of our winners tonight are uh, teachers as well as writers. Um, you are a writer in residence and I'm sure give many um, uh, master classes about the methodologies that you have uh, developed over all these years. This uh, immersion project is bound by a summer. And uh, as you uh, I'm sure can describe, there's only so much you can control when you decide to immerse in a particular time frame. Um, how did you uh, shape this uh, as character, as, as reporting, and how did it uh, run away from you and force you to catch up with it? <laughs> run away from me and paralyze me at moments. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I, you know, I, I've been in this long enough to every time I start a project, I think somehow I'm going to be much more efficient in the reporting. And as you know, reporting is so damn messy. And so inevitably, you sort of start to wade into the water and you realize, my God, I don't know what I've gotten myself into. And I knew enough that I needed some boundaries here. And so I chose this temporal boundary of this one arbitrary summer. And as you said, it, was, it limited me. There were stories I came across that I couldn't find a way to kind of plug into that summer. There were other stories that had happened earlier that I was able to find a way to place them in that summer, um, uh, you know, because talking about the aftermath of, of certain events. And so I spent that, what I thought was going to be just a summer, I spent the really, you know, close to a year just talking to people looking for stories. And, you know, I, I knew I wasn't entirely sure what I was looking for, but I knew that I would know when I heard it, that I was looking for stories that surprised me, that knocked me off balance. And what I had, my challenge was, of course, is I had this cast of, large cast of characters and how to help readers keep track of them and not let it read as a collection of short stories. And some of the stories, you know, find their way through the entire summer. Other stories are very self-contained. But I will tell you, there was a moment when I was set down to write and I was really, I was paralyzed both by the, I think I was, had this experience of kind of secondary trauma from hearing all these stories and also really grappling with the structure. And I was at a loss and I remember uh, having dinner with my friend Chris Ware, the cartoonist, and we would, we have dinner every few weeks or did before this <laughs> pandemic. And, uh, and I, I was just, up in arms and I remember Krista said to me just sit down just just tell the stories and that's what I did and once I began to sit down and tell the stories I was able to sort of piece them together like a puzzle um, and uh, and my hope is is that it it holds together as as a whole um, uh, and 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 in fact you know that I'm my presence is sort of the scaffolding that that summer is built on that I sort of find my way from story to story from individual to individual. Well, it certainly does hold together. And I imagine that, and you are the scaffolding. Um, and I, just to continue the kind of instruction portion of the conversation for our graduate students. Yeah, um, when you're selecting characters and stories that you're going to try to weave into that whole, you're, you're evaluating for their, for their intrinsic power, as you say, that knocks you back or surprises you, but also, you're, I presume you're, you're thinking about the landscape. You want something of the whole to be represented or something resonant beyond individual experience. So what was the whole that you had in your head, the landscape that you hoped would be right. touched upon? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, what drove me to the book was this notion that I do think we've got this, this is a myth well, two things. One, there's this myth that people get accustomed or hardened or numb to the violence. And, um, and I think it has a profound impact on, on people. I mean, it shapes their lives. And I think people work really hard to keep it from defining them. Um, and the other part of it, of course, is to sort of make that connection between the violence and the profound poverty. Um, and of course, the profound isolation of these communities having everything to do with the history of race in this country. And so I was looking for stories in some way, manner or another that touched 
on on all of those. And of course, the other part of that, Steve, too, is you know you you come across great stories, and the thing that you're asking of people, and it's asking a lot. You're asking for access to to their lives. You're asking you know not only to share the stories with you, but to share it in this very public way. And so. There were stories that I came across where people, for you know reasons of their own and usually very good reasons, didn't want to share their stories in that public manner. And so part of it also too was finding people who were self-reflective and willing to share their stories, if not eager to. Thank you. Um, there are some questions uh, arriving in chat um, and I'm just going to start uh, perusing here and, and sharing some of them with you. Um, there's one specific one for um, Shahan, which um, I just had, yeah. Uh, what were the demands of the hostage takers during this crisis, since you're, you're giving us, you're basically shattering our, um, uh, uh, whatever suspense we might have brought to the adaptive yeah, team. No, that's actually kind of important. <laughs> uh, they had three demands, very disparate demands, but the, the motive and uh, the motive is real, the, what the, one of them called the straw that broke the camel's back, but the trigger was the release of a Hollywood biopic of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Uh, this is a 1977 movie called Muhammad, the Messenger of God uh, that was released on March 9th. So this was the afternoon that the movie was get, uh, premiering in, in New York and Los Angeles. And this group uh, believed it to be sacrilegious. So this is now kind of where, he, where, where we can see maybe the relevance of more re recent events as well. But this was, uh, yeah, I mean, that was the major demand that they wanted that movie pulled off. So it was a blasphemy issue. Uh, that the Muhammad, they, they, they said that Muhammad was being portrayed on, on film, which he was not in the movie. And the movie was made by a Muslim man as well, an immigrant to America from Syria, from, from Aleppo, Syria, Mustafa Akkad. Um, and there are other demands as well. Uh, there was a de this, this is where the kind of the story is not about, it's, it's, it's kind of framed by those 40 hours, but of course I'm, I'm kind of tracing the long history of the people, the central characters and where they're coming into this 40 hours from. So um, there's also things that happened before this event. So there's also a, a, this person's own family, the hostage takers own family had been murdered in, in a brutal crime through four years earlier in 1973. So there was a demand of delivering the murderers to him in the B'nai B'rith where he would presumably behead them. Well, he, he said he would behead them publicly um and uh and yeah i mean and so th those were and then and then the third demand was to kind of also just a reimbursement of uh some money that had been spent so it, it spanned the demands were kind of spanned a whole range of very personal to yeah. to just these profound ideas of yeah. blasphemy and what what is justice in the largest sense and what does allah demand in a situation where injustice has been done so it is really it's justice being the thread that ties the three demands together. Yeah, and the, and blasphemy obviously is a prefigures um, politically informed violence later as well. Um, about five minutes ago, when I was listening to Alex, I just had this little uh, reflection about how wonderful it was to be in a room with such great writers and such enriching conversation and an audience and not talk about the pandemic. And yet, <laughs> uh, there, is, there is quite a reasonable question here uh, that is going to end this reverie. Uh, I, the, the question is uh, that we'd like to hear each of the authors talk, um, the journalists, and then uh, Carrie, I'll, I'll kind of uh, turn to you with a different version of this, um, about how uh, the pandemic uh, is playing out. Uh, well, let me ask Bart first in agriculture and then Alex about Chicago. And, um, and, and I think those are the two where the question is the most, most relevant. Yeah, well, I would just say it had an immediate effect on me because I was supposed to be in Germany right now at the Bayer stockholders meeting. <laughs> and I had bought a one share actually, um, <laughs> and I should, I should mention, you know, I was trained by some really amazing historians, uh, Ed Ayers at University of Virginia, Grace Hale, a bunch of other people. 
but they, we didn't learn journalism, you know, we didn't really know how to go on the ground. So I've had to kind of learn this on the fly. And so I thought, okay, buying a share, that sounds great. And uh, I'll tell you the Zoom version of the shareholders meeting was six hours straight, no breaks, no breaks, literally just watching Zoom from four o'clock in the morning, Germany, uh, until I don't know what time it was when I gave up. But, uh, and it was really interesting because here's the interesting confluence with this company, right? It's, it's both a company that's on the, the cutting edge of healthcare and dealing, you know, so they're talking a great deal about the pandemic but at the exact moment in that stockholders meeting, they're getting peppered by what's happening with this Dicamba lawsuit? What's happening with this Roundup lawsuit? And so it's this really interesting merger with Bayer and also Monsanto, this kind of big pharma and big farm, right? Big ag. Um, some would argue, you know, there's this, this Roundup story about cancer and all this um, being caused potentially by glyphosate. These discussions are ongoing, of course, right now. Well, interestingly, Bayer also sells medication that helps you deal with cancer. So there's this kind of interesting story here with, um, and you could see it in that pandemic moment in that shareholders meeting where they were playing up this kind of, don't look here at this roundup in dicamba litigation where people are talking about their health, look at all our great stuff that's helping to deal with the pandemic right now. Um, and it was, I think, a really kind of clever, uh, I'm almost magic trick, um, but I have to say, after the six hours on Zoom, um, I crashed pretty hard. So <laughs> I would say that it's not, it's not fun to go to a stockholders meeting on Zoom. <laughs> How serious is the liability that Bayer bought from Monsanto? Huge. I mean, they, 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 haven't, they have shareholders that are suing the company. Uh, you know, even last year, there was a, a moment where the, the leadership, you know, they had a vote of no confidence uh, because we're talking about billions of dollars and they're currently into discussions about settling all these lawsuits, these roundup lawsuits. Some figures are 10 billion, you know, 11 billion. If you go back to 2008 and you look at their ticker, since we're all on our computers, you can go do it and look at August of 2018 when the first roundup case was decided, $285 million, one person, um, you know, it just dropped off. And the dicamba cases came the, the big verdict recently in Dicamba was in January. I was in that trial and you can see it again drop because Dicamba is the solution to Roundup. And yet now people are seeing that they're both problematic. So, um, so, so it's huge. And I think they're going to be moving to try and settle as fast as they can because they know that this is, yeah. this, this just needs Ex to be Ex Existential. Yep. Alex, how has uh, COVID-19 passed through the lives of the people you chronicled and the communities that they belong to in Chicago? You know, Chicago was the first city early on where we began to notice the disparity um, of the pandemic in uh, minority communities, first the black community and now the Hispanic Latino community. Um, and, you know, a lot of it had to do with the underlying conditions of people in those communities. Um, partly the lack of access to healthcare over the years, but also it's also a consequence of stress and trauma uh, on the health of individuals. And so we've seen that disparity now, not only in Chicago, but elsewhere around this country. I mean, I think the other thing is, you know, I think there's some, I mean, at least for me, it, you've got to sort of have some sense of hope and there is this kind of shared distress at the moment. And maybe it is a way of building, maybe a way of building uh, in which we build community. Um, uh, because these are communities, again, that are so profoundly isolated from the rest of the city, both geographically and spiritually. Um, and so maybe this is a way that will, in some manner, connect us um, uh, in ways that we haven't managed to before. Yeah, yeah, this whole subject of after the, after the pandemic is going to be a rich one. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Carrie. Uh, I'll just read it. Um, it's from Alice and then the words all run together, so I won't try to separate what's the second name and the third name. Um, you said Trotter encouraged African Americans to vote in their best interest, but that he was critical of both the Democrats and the Republicans. So who did Trotter encourage Black Americans to vote for in those years? Or what was his electoral strategy, if he had one? His electoral strategy, and thank you for the question, his electoral strategy was pretty sophisticated in that he really argued that although African Americans on a national level could not sway an election, 
um, until we get to 1912 and the election of Woodrow Wilson, that African Americans locally on the state level, particularly outside of the South, in which you know more than 90% of African Americans were disenfranchised, that outside of the South, African Americans in the North and the West, even though they were a small part proportion of the population, they could um, act as swing voters, and he actually used that term to uh, elect people to office who would meet their immediate needs. So in Boston, for instance, he was an er somebody who advised African Americans who could vote to vote nationally for Republicans, but to vote on every single level, locally, school department, uh, governor, mayor, to vote for whichever candidate was appealing to the black community. And this was actually very successful in Boston in uh, various amounts of, of um, elections, I argue in the book, because uh, he was able to get African Americans to swing local office to the Democrats, which uh, Massachusetts at the time was a pretty strong, lar large stronghold for the Republicans. So to answer your question, I would say that his um, mantra was that electoral politics had to happen because um, the country had betrayed the promises made by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, um, and those were happening in real time as he was, as he was you know, alive, um, but that electoral um, votes had to be done based on whichever uh, person, whatever party, whatever policy was going to immediately meet the needs of African-American people. So um, in 1912, for instance, he urged African-Americans to vote for Woodrow Wilson. There's pretty uh, strong evidence that that um, led to uh, Wilson winning in um, a strong Republican stronghold like Massachusetts and Ohio. Um, and when that happened, um, of course, Woodrow Wilson uh, betrayed um, promises that he had originally made for civil rights. Um, but Trotter's argument was that black people had no choice in that election because the Republican Party had betrayed African Americans through um, acts of, you know, not protecting and enforcing anti-lynching law. So I think um, in that sense, it was pretty, um, and, and this is why I argue that he was radical, it was radical in the sense that he was saying that um, voting should be done based on the needs the demands of African American community, but that you shouldn't, uh, African Americans should not um, put, as he said, your eggs in one basket on a party that has betrayed us or a party that has yet, yet to show us the goods. And that's kind of a, a quote he had in 1912. Um, so I think that's pre very prescient for today in terms of, you know, um, he was definitely somebody who was at heart um, really believed that. Um, you should not vote for party, and you had to force elected officials to meet the direct needs of the people um, who voted them into office. Yeah, obviously very resonant uh, today. It's, um, it's exciting to see the major prizes catching up with the scholarship of your generation of historians. You see it across the board, some big biographies of familiar figures like Frederick Douglass, and then mm -hmm. familiar figures like Elaine Locke, which won David yeah. last year or the year before. Yeah, there's obviously African American history is as rich as and varied as any history. But talking about this zone that we're in, political and intellectual leadership at different eras of what are the what are the eras of African American history? Do you think that your generation of scholars see as opportunity the way you did with Trotter that really haven't been uh, researched and written with the originality and the and the kind of revisionism that's required to really understand our own heritage. I think that um, uh, I, I'm um, very humbled and very proud to be amongst a generation of younger historians who are reevaluating. Uh, for instance, the black power movements of the 60s and 70s and sort of resurrecting um, notions of gender and race and sexuality that have been overlooked within those movements. I think of you know, people like Ashley Farmer and um, um, and others who have, who have done that work. Um, I think that the era that I concentrate on between the end of the Civil War and sort of this progressive moment in the 1920s and 1930s is a moment, um, and you mentioned the Elaine Locke book, which was masterfully done, kind of looking at what's going on in that area, in that era, but not looking at it and confining it merely to um, reconstruction ends and there's lynching and therefore African-American people have no, no political thought, uh, thought uh, will, uh, control, um, given that it's sort of the nadir of race relations. So I really, I really, um, am hopeful in terms of being a historian that many of the, um, the moments in American history that we take for granted as historians as looking a certain way, whether that be the Black Power Movement, whether that be the 1970s or 80s, whether that be 
the um, you know revolutionary era that there's a whole crop of people um, who are reevaluating what that looks like, and it, it definitely complicates our notion of what um, African American history is and what impact African American people have had on the political and cultural consciousness of the country, even when we don't think that African American people uh, were there or were um, were um, in, in, in numbers large enough to make have an effect. Yeah, no, that, that's that's great. Um, I um, I think we've got one last round uh, briefly for each of our uh, winners, and uh, I'll take uh, inspiration from uh, Vanessa Rodriguez, who um, asks um, uh, a happy question, which is. Could each of you, and I, it's, it's always awful to be asked this sort of question first, so I'm going to go with Alex because he has the, 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 probably the most experience with being asked questions like this. Can you just like resurrect some small moment of joy that you had while either writing or researching this book, that moment of uh, discovery or, or satisfaction that makes this life? Uh, you know, I'm actually going to talk about, I, I can think of a moment, actually a recent moment post-book um, about one of the characters in the book, a uh, young man named Marcelo Sanchez. And I won't give away his story, but Marcelo was a, uh, uh, when I met him, he was 17 years old and he was walking a kind of tightrope. He had been a member of a gang and yet he was a straight A student. And he was really trying to sort of figure out his place in the world and trying to figure out himself. And so... Um, without giving away too much, Marcelo not long ago graduated from DePaul University, and I used a, a pseudonym for his last name in the book. Um, we, he and I had decided, given the crime he had committed, that it was uh, would allow him to move on in life. And a, a couple of months ago, before the pandemic, we had a we had a small panel discussion. It was myself and Marcelo and the mayor, Mayor Mayor Lightfoot. And Marcelo called me two days before the panel and said, Alex, I just want to make sure that they introduced me by my real name. And he was kind of taking ownership of his story and ownership mm -hmm. of his life. And it was just kind of remarkable to hear. And then he was just, he's, uh, I mean, he's now working at a bank and he's just doing, I'm, I, I just uh, am so proud of sort of what, what he's become. I mean, he's kind of finally made sense of who he is. Um, yeah, no, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, Bart, nobody gets up at four in the morning to zoom into Berlin unless they <laughs> love what they do. Uh, but apart from loving uh, Monsanto enough to get up at four in the morning and zoom into Berlin, what, what other moments of discovery along the research trail or the composition trail that I think it's a lot like Alex. We're so lucky to meet people in these journeys that change our lives. There's someone on this call who has traveled with me and shot photos of us, me doing weird things, trying to, to get into various headquarters and all that. And we've had, I think that, that, that bond, that friendship that you build through that, probably the biggest moment that's related to this was a student in my class. I was just teaching on what I was doing related to dicamba. And I told them I was going to the trial in Missouri on Saturday, uh, I was gonna travel. And the student came up to me after the class and said, I'm coming with you. And I said, well, you have two days to book a plane ticket. <laughs> you know, like, it's going to be really expensive. She said, I don't, you know, I don't care. I want to be at this trial. And it actually turned out to be amazing because it was like, you know, we just had our notes. We couldn't bring in any electronics. And, and this, you know, the student was able to, to write down things I wasn't able to get. And, and it was this amazing experience. We walked out of that trial which was in Rush Limbaugh Courthouse, by the way. As a writer, you knew when you arrived, you're like, okay, this is gonna be great. Named after his, his relative, not him. But anyway, you know, it was just that moment and seeing the student, you know, really embrace the importance of this moment, you know, that it's priceless. So I would say that the time we get to spend with the people that travel with us on these journeys, um, I'm so lucky to have them in my life. I'm going to have trouble getting over those three words, Rush Limbaugh Courthouse. <laughs> what, what county of this great country of ours does that courthouse yeah, exist in? Southeastern District Court in Missouri, so, so, so south of St. Louis. And uh, yeah, and, and his cousin, distant cousin, Stephen Limbaugh, was the judge. And all I can say is Stephen Limbaugh is a very nice guy. So uh, very different character for sure. So. Okay. All right, uh, Shahan, 
uh, you've had plenty of time now to choose one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't even know if I've arrived at really a moment of pure joy, but I, I spent a lot of time with um, hostages. There was a lot, there was close to 150 and many obviously around and, 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 but I've also, I mean, the real challenge was the hostage takers and uh, many of them are now free. And, uh, and uh, you know, one, one, of, one of the hostage takers that I, I did end up spending, I flew out to Colorado to spend some time with him. And, uh, and he, was, he was one of the more, in, my, in, in constructing it, I knew that he was the, one of the most violent ones of the 12 men that had entered. And so I went in with a really, I, I don't know, I'd never met a hostage taker before after 40 years after the fact. So, but I spent a day with him and now he, he does, he does amazing work. He's, he's working on kind of uh, getting young men who are getting out of prison and reintroducing them into society, linking people up and, and you know, has support of Colorado State now, has got them the state funding to expand his programs, building halfway houses. And, and I spent this all this time with this character um, who is an important character in my book. And, and and it was, and we were obviously just mostly, I was interviewing him about what had happened, but it was a reminder of why I, I had been so drawn to this, this, it, this story in the first place, which is that it's, it, it's, it's very complex. Everything that was happening with characters, or there's no easy way to paint these characters. And so, and it was just kind of, it was really, it was a special moment to see what somebody's done after get, spending a lifetime almost in prison. Yeah. and how he's come back and and so i'd say that'd be my uh, the one very special moment i can think of yeah it's inspiring carrie oh um there are actually many many moments of joy despite what seems like kind of a, a grim subject matter the era that he lived in i think the the biggest one that sticks out is um when i started working on the book um in earnest and uh it was very difficult to find records from the 1920s um, that were primary sources that I felt as a historian I could include in my book uh, without them being just kind of hearsay. So I was like, went through all of the records I could find in the 1920s, and it was very daunting to find records of Trotter. And then in some archive um, in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts State um, Archives, I found his FBI records, the Bureau of Investigation um, monitoring Trotter beginning in 1919. And um, the joy I had uh, was that it was documented, um, his radicalism and the way that his radicalism um, was feared <laughs> by the power structure in a way that I was told as a historian that I wouldn't be able to find. Um, and so that was a moment where I realized the book would come together, that this was uh, more of a significant story than just me um, liking Trotter and liking the history, um, that it was sort of um, put his life into this long um, um, history of African-American activists who were um, so radical they were monitored by the government. Well, um, thank you, Vanessa, for that question, because I think in these times we should all um, uh, talk about something joyful at least once a day, maybe twice, <laughs> and now we've, uh, we've checked, checked that off. Uh, this evening, thanks to our speakers. Uh, congratulations to all four of you. It's just so fully deserved and what a pleasure to spend some time with you and to understand uh, where these uh, uh, terrific works uh, came from, are coming from in a couple of cases. Um, please, uh, all of you uh, who've joined us, uh, think about clicking on those links in the chat to uh, to actually own these books. Normally we'd have a chance to connect you uh, with that opportunity at a table or um, <laughs> through a bookstore, but uh, uh, it's, it's, these are uh, wonderful ways to pass what remains of this miserable pandemic. So um, please add them to your stack. Uh, and again, congratulations to everyone. Thank you, Abby and Lisa and team for putting this together in difficult uh, circumstances. And um, everyone be well, take care, and we will see you the old fashioned way uh, next year, I trust. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.